as we start talking today, I have a couple things to say before we go. A, on the screen, it's very hard to find pictures of food during the holiday season that isn't a turkey or a ham and potatoes and stuff. So I thought I'd mix it up a little bit and put it on a banana leaf. I think that's what that is. And, it, and Arlene's going, yeah, that looks delicious. Um, so today we are going to talk about our spiritual feeding. And today is actually an important day for us to do this because as was mentioned, it's second Sunday. After this, we're gonna go and eat and we're gonna probably eat together. And then after that, we're gonna take part in our communion service, which is a different form of eating. But as we talk through this lesson, I want us to think about all the things that we're gonna do today, what we're doing right now, this afternoon, and then if you're part of the member service or if you want to watch or see what we do in the member service, by all means, you can witness that. And I want you to think about those things as we move forward today. Another little disclaimer, uh, in it, preparing a lesson months in advance, odds are someone's going to put out content that matches. Don, your video last week of uh, the bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life, uh, is bread of heaven, thank you, is uh, pretty well spot on with at least half of this. So if you watched Don's video, this is a little refresher, um, but yeah, thank you for the content. Okay, so our spiritual feeding. Today we're going to start in the book of John, and this is Jesus speaking to Peter and uh, interacting with his apostles. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said to him, yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee, he saith unto him, or Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. He saith to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. And again, a third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And by this point, Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, Peter is a man of multiple threes, for those of you who know his story. And I don't believe that Jesus here for a second is questioning if Peter loves him. I think he understands that Peter loves him with great vigor. So why the question? And obviously Peter wants to know why the question is being asked the third time. I don't think this is questioning his love for Jesus. This is helping him focus his love. And Jesus' instructions here that aren't necessarily said beyond feed my sheep are, take that love that you have for me and turn it to the flock. Take that love and that devotion that you have for me, the person you call your Messiah, the person you call your master, and focus it towards the sheep of the flock. Okay? So we see here that Jesus has a concern for his sheep. And that's a fair concern because historically, the shepherds of Israel hadn't done their job appropriately, had done their job according to God's word. So Jesus here is trying to give his apostles, his shepherds of his flock, all the tools necessary to do their job accordingly. So when we talk about feeding my sheep, we need to know who his sheep are. And for this, we need a little bit more history. This is one small verse out of the book of Ezekiel 34. It's actually the last verse in Ezekiel 34. It says, and you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture are my people. And this is Yahweh. This is God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, speaking to his prophet Ezekiel while in captivity. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture. You are my people, and I am your God, declares Yahweh, the sovereign Lord. Now, I didn't want to put the whole chapter on the screen because then I'd just be sitting up here reading. But before this, God is telling Ezekiel about all the things that the shepherds of Israel, the leadership of Israel, had failed at doing. That they'd misled the flock. 
And because of that, they were going to experience many years of hardship. But in the middle of that warning to Ezekiel or that speaking to Ezekiel, he brings up the fact that there will come a day where he'll raise up to his people, to his flock, to Israel, a shepherd. And that that shepherd will be the one true shepherd. Okay, so I want us to hold that into our thoughts. And now the question is, Keith, where do we fit into this? Because we're not Israel, right? So now we move forward back to the book of John. Here we read Jesus' words where he says, I am the good shepherd. Do you think he knew what God, Yahweh, had told Ezekiel? He knew that one was supposed to come, and he says, I am that shepherd. I know my own, and, I, and, all, and, sorry, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. Brent, great song choices this afternoon. I, Brandon says it, it always happens. Brent and I did not talk beforehand. But Jesus here is showing that the one true shepherd, the one that was spoke about to Ezekiel, that would come and gather God's sheep to him, that that shepherd would be someone who would speak to more than just that current flock. And we see here, Jesus says, I have sheep that aren't from this sheepfold. Who was Jesus sent to? He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel primarily. And then afterwards, when he's about ready to die, be resurrected, and then ascend, he tells his apostles that we saw with Peter, feed my sheep. And we learn through the story of Peter in the book of Acts that his sheepfold is expanded out to the Gentiles and to the world beyond Israel alone. So Jesus here prophetically says, there are sheep that are not part of this sheepfold, but I need to bring them to me. And they will listen to my voice. And as we go through these slides, you're going to see, once again, colors in the text. If you're paying attention, that's hopefully for memory recall. So that when we hit a color, you can go, what other words were colored that color? Because they do have a theme. Okay? So the idea here is to tie this together as a great picture. But he says, they will know me, my sheep do know me, and they will listen to my voice. So that there will be one flock under the one true shepherd. So, if we're part of God's flock... And we're part of God's sheep. What do we eat? Because Peter was told, feed them. Right? That was the command to him. So as God's sheep, what do we eat? Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. God's instruction to Israel. You must keep carefully all these commandments I am giving you today. So that you may live. Increase in number and go in and occupy the land that the Lord Yahweh promised to your ancestors. Remember the whole, the whole way by which he has brought you these 40 years through the wilderness so that he might, by humbling you, test you to see if you have it within you to keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you with unfamiliar manna. He did this to teach you that humankind cannot live by bread alone, but also by everything. Everything that comes from the Lord's mouth. Why did he give them the manna in the wilderness? First of all, who gave them the manna from the wild in the wilderness? It was Yahweh, it was God that gave it to them. It wasn't, he did it through Moses, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But it was God that gave them this manna. And what was the motivation? Yes, they were hungry physically. They needed food while they were wandering through the wilderness. 
But the tool here was to remind them or show them where the food was coming from. And to remind them that it didn't matter what the food was. The thing that was important was God's commandments. The words proceeding from the mouth of God. The things that told them how to live, how to be obedient, how to remain as sheep within his fold. This text is also quoted by Jesus when he's tempted by Satan. When Satan says, turn these rocks into bread. And he says that man should not live by bread and bread alone. So we see this being used by our Lord and Savior. Continuation of what do, uh, what do we eat? Isaiah 55. And this fits into Brent, the middle song that Brent brought, brought to our attention today. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money. The D is not on there, I'm sorry. And without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And, you, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So this is a prophet. This is the prophet Isaiah, and this is much further down the line. This is after they've gone through their times, uh, many of the years of them having a king. This is before the fall of the northern ten tribes, and Isaiah is pleading with the people, pleading with the flock of Israel to incline their ear to turn to God when they are hungry or thirsty for life, for truth, and that God would be able to and would provide those things for them. So we can hear the food we are to eat, and we need to listen to those words. We're to eat God's words. They better taste good. I mean, I think that was part of Israel's biggest complaint in the wilderness is the manna got plain. It got boring. What, is, what does David say about how God's words taste? Here in Psalms 119, 103, he says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 19.10, more to be desired are they, God's words, than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. If you're a true believer in God, if you're a true sheep of his fold, how sweet is it when the, your master, when your God, your, when Yahweh communicates with you? To David... When God put his words into him, he says it's sweeter than honey in his mouth. To take those things in, when God is communicating with you, it's sweetness. Jeremiah takes this one step further. Jeremiah lived during a time where part of his life, it seems that Israel didn't even really have good access to the law of God. They'd lost it. They'd at least stumbled so far from it that it felt like it was lost. Hilkiah, his father, finds the book of the law, and they read that book, and they change under Josiah's reign. And he says, thy words, the words of God, they were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. So Jeremiah takes this even further because he didn't have those words. He didn't have what David obviously had great access to and said was so sweet as honey. And Jeremiah says, when, I, when we found them, 
I consumed them. I took them in. And what was the result? Jeremiah brings in this emotional response to the consuming of God's words, right? So far, we've talked about how they taste and how they're sweet and good for us. But now Jeremiah is saying, I ate them and they brought joy and rejoicing to my heart. I guarantee you that by the end of Jeremiah's life, there were words that God spoke to him that didn't bring joy and rejoicing to his heart, but brought sadness to his heart. So we start to see a correlation between God's words, consuming them, taking them in, and how that interacts with our brains, our hearts, our emotions. Okay? Continuation, a little bit deeper down this rabbit hole. Ezekiel 2. And we're going to start at verse 8, and then we're going to read through chapter 3, verse 3. This is God speaking to Ezekiel during his commissioning. As for you, son of man, listen to what I am saying to you. Do not rebel like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked and realized a hand was stretched out to me, and in it was a written scroll. Yeah, that's paper, parchment, with writing on it. He unrolled it before me, and it had writing on the front and the back. You ever run out of space on one side, so you have to keep going to the next? Well, this was filled with laments, mourning, and woe. Whose laments, mourning, and woe? God's. God has emotions. He said to me, son of man, eat what you see in front of you. Eat this scroll. And then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, son of man, feed your stomach and fill your belly with this scroll I am giving to you. So I ate it. And when he was eating it, it was sweet like honey in his mouth. Keep thinking about these things, okay? I want to cover this one and then we'll talk about them. Similarly, Revelation chapter 10. And now, for those of you who have your Bibles open, yes, I am picking out sections of these verses for now. We're going to go back and read them in whole, but I'm really trying to just drive home a certain point here first. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 10, verse 8, 9a, which would be the first part of verse 9, and then the first part of verse 10, okay? Because we're talking about how God's words taste. Verse 8, then the voice that I had heard from heaven began to speak to me again. This is going to sound a lot like Ezekiel, guys. Go and take the open scroll in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take the scroll and eat it. You see the dot, dot, dot. That's where I'm cutting you off for now. 10. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. And it did taste as sweet as honey in my mouth. Now, for those of us who look at the Bible often, or maybe not even that often, I think that most people would know that the book of Ezekiel is way far back from the book of Revelation. And that's appropriate in the written word because on a timeline, Ezekiel is way far back from John. How similar are the words here spoken to these men, these prophets, these men who were going to go out and tell the sheep, the flock, the words of God. They had to consume them. John, if it's the apostle John, how much of God's spirit did he already have? It's a good question. What I know is that here in Revelation, when he's receiving this vision, he's given more, and he's given 
probably something very similar to Ezekiel that's full of lament, sadness, and woe. So when we eat something, it tastes good. Hey kids, how many sweets taste really good? All of them, Keith. Okay, so what does it do to your tummy afterwards? Well, if we remember Jeremiah's words, when he consumed God's words, it brought him joy. Maybe he was more controlled. He just didn't eat all the sweets in one go. What we see here in continuing on in Ezekiel says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, this is right after, okay? You see where we're at? Chapter 3, verse 10. Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you receive in your heart and hear with your ears, and go to the exiles, to your people, and speak to them, and say to them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went embittered in the rage of my spirit, and the hand of Yahweh was strong on me. We're going, to wrap it, we're, going to, we're going to talk about them together. Back to Revelation. You see the little note there. It's whole this time. Verse 9, So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take the scroll and eat it. That's where we stopped. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it, and it did taste sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. These two men are given the same commissioning. They're given words visually in a physical form. They're fed those words. And then they're told to go and take those words to the flock, to the people. In Ezekiel's time, to the people of Israel. In John's time, to the church. That includes both groups in that one flock. Okay? But I have a question. If it tastes sweet as honey, why does it make me sick? Why, does it, why do these men experience these things? If Ezekiel and John were fed with God's spirit, his words, why did their stomachs turn bitter? How did Ezekiel experience rage while God's hand was upon him? Now, it does say that Ezekiel's spirit experienced rage in his spirit. But whose spirit is he full of right now? Yahweh's. Same as John. Digesting is a way to spiritually connect with God's divine and just emotions or to know him. You want to get to know Yahweh, your God? Listen, consume, eat his words, take them in. And yes, sometimes they will be bitter when they settle in your stomach. I hope so. We have very human moments where we realize that we've messed up. And when we read God's words to remind us that we messed up or to identify that we messed up, that's going to sit bitter in the stomach, but it motivates change. It motivates these men to go out and do the work they were commanded to do, to explain to the sheep of Israel and the sheep of the church that they needed to stay true to what was spoken about in Deuteronomy, keep my commandments to the end. We talk or hear a lot about building an emotional connection with our God. This is how we do it. By accepting his spirit and taking it in and digesting it. Okay. Now we move to Jesus' words, because he said earlier in John, that, or later in John, John 10, that he was or is the shepherd of this flock. 
So if you thought eating scrolls was confusing, let's get through this one. We're going to do quite a bit of reading in John chapter 6 here. So starting in verse 26, Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the loaves of bread you wanted. Do not work for the food that disappears, but for the food that remains to eternal life. The food which the Son of Man will give to you. For God the Father has put his seal of approval on him. So then they said to him, what must we do to accomplish the deeds God requires? Jesus replied, this is the deed God requires. Sounds a lot like Deuteronomy. To believe in the one whom he sent. So they said to him, then what miraculous sign will you perform so that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our ancestors... They ate, they ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus told them, I tell you the solemn truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but my father is giving you the true bread from heaven. Thirty-three through thirty-five, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never go hungry. And the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. See how this is speaking to that text in Isaiah, that's speaking to Deuteronomy, that's speaking to all those things that we've read already. And he is saying that he is the one. He is the manna that comes from heaven that will give them life. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who hears and learns from the Father comes to me. I cut some texts out of this PowerPoint because I figured it would be too long. But we need to remember whose words Jesus spoke. If you were going to take Jesus, flatten him out, and then roll him up into a scroll, there it is. It's the same words from the same being, the same Yahweh, as the scroll that Ezekiel ate and the scroll that John would eat. The same words that the prophets from before had been delivering, whether it be Isaiah, Jeremiah, or even Hosea, Amos, and so on and so forth. They were given those words to guide the flock. Jesus is an extension of those guides. But his bread that he's giving right now, that God is feeding through him to his people, is the bread that gives life but it requires hearing and learning. Continuing on in John 6, I tell you the solemn truth, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that has come down from heaven so that a person may eat from it and not die. Continuing, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It's interesting to me how gently he breaks them into this concept. You have to eat the bread. I am the bread. The bread that I give is my flesh. Okay, just making sure we're all there. Then the Jews who were hostile to Jesus began to argue with one another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up 
on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I, be- and I live because of the Father, so the one who consumes me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread your ancestors ate, but then later died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. On the last day. Keep it in place. Okay, don't worry. You're not alone. I thought eating scrolls was weird. Are we really supposed to eat the flesh of Jesus, our Messiah? And if you think that we're the first people to ask these questions, we're not. John 6 continues with the disciples saying, then many of his disciples, when they heard these things, said, this is really difficult. I I don't understand what he's saying. Who can understand it? And Jesus, as he does, gives an answer. Not sure it satisfied their question fully at the point in time. But he leads into that it is the spirit that quickeneth or that brings life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. Couldn't make it much clearer. That to eat his flesh and to drink his blood is to take his words that are his father's words and consume them. Make them what nourishes you. Make them what keeps you alive now and will keep you alive in the kingdom. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. After God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son, who he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the world. When haven't we seen this message today? We started back in Deuteronomy. We hit some prophets in the middle. We hit John in the book of Revelation. We see the the consistency of the message spoken throughout time. And now in these later latter days, through his own son. And Peter, the man that we started with where Jesus said, you need to go and you need to turn your attention to the flock and feed the sheep. Later in Peter's own writings, he's excited and he's praying in a very positive way. And he says, I can pray this way. I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. He gave them the tools necessary. The tools have always been available to those who would pick up the torch. It makes me think of early on in Isaiah when he says, here I am, send me. Or when Joshua says, as for me and my family, will serve the Lord. Any sheep of the flock has had these things accessible. And now for us, it's these words. The words that Jesus taught, the words that we have recorded for us through the prophets and through all of Israel's history. We have the things necessary for life and godliness. So when we go through today, Yes, eat because it tastes good. But remember that you're eating now and in the communion service, you're eating then. And really, when you're participating in that service, remember. 
remember the words on the scroll. Let's have a song. Let's conclude with song number 162, Fill My Cup, Lord, number 162. <clears throat> Please stand as we sing. <laughs> Great Father and God in heaven, we pray to you, Lord, to give thanks for the words that you have provided for us, this food that we are to fill ourselves with, and we pray that you would allow us to take it in and use it as sustenance for our soul, for our life, and that it might shine through us to those around us, that everyone in this world might have a way to come to you that you've provided for them. We pray that you would continue to be with us and strengthen us and guide us as we go forward in our lives. We pray for those who are traveling or soon to be traveling for safe safety in those times. We ask that you would forgive us for the times that we fall short of your will and that you would heal those who are in need spiritually or physically as you see fit. We pray most of all, Lord, that we would be found worthy of a place in your kingdom when your son brings it to this earth for you. This we ask that be thy will, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen.